Every time I open the hangar door to go flying, I realize that I'm one of the lucky guys doing something that I dreamt of as a kid.
The Army's helicopters today are becoming more rugged and more practical machines. So versatile, they can do many different jobs in the environment of the battle area, and in many different ways. We've had an opportunity to do flybys for people. The, the comment that we always get is, I remember the sound. The rotor blades make a popping noise uh, that you can hear from a long way off. Joe Galloway uh, did a presentation at the uh, wall in Washington back a number of years ago during one of our reunions. Joe uh, came up to the point in his conversation or his speech where he talked about that sound and what it meant to the guy on the ground. He said, we hated you when you took us into battle. He said, the thing was, we always knew when you heard that sound again, you were coming to get us. And you wouldn't leave without us. So it has become one of the few aircraft that can be iconic, not only in its visual state, but just the audible. People who don't know what a Huey looks like can tell you when one flies by. know that, we can look around it, we can see people bigger, stronger, smarter than we are, have more opportunity than we have, but in the one way that we are all born equal is in matters of courage. Each of us can have all that we want, you can't use it up, it's the key to success, it's the key to freedom. You cannot place statues or build memorials 
in thin air. These airplanes, rescued, restored, returned to the sky, are the memorials. Through them, we give enduring thanks to those who gave everything they had to defend everything that we hold dear. By sharing them, we remind each other of the sacrifice. By sharing them, we introduce our heirs to their heritage. One week each summer, these national treasures are flown here. Twice each day, those who restored them present them to those who risk their lives to fight in them. And those who really did it tell the rest of us how it really was. It is a singular series of history lessons that anyone who cherishes liberty ought to see. During the Korean War, survival rates for soldiers wounded in the field rose dramatically when the injured were stabilized and rapidly transported to field hospitals by helicopter. In Vietnam, the new Bell UH-1 Huey helicopter, an exceptionally adaptable aircraft, became a priceless tool for evacuating the wounded. During two tours of duty, then Major, now Major General retired Patrick Brady, flew over 2,500 medevac missions, recovering over 5,000 patients. For his actions on January 6, 1968, he was awarded the Medal of Honor. The citation reads, for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity in action at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty, Major Brady distinguished himself while serving in the Republic of Vietnam, commanding a UH-1H ambulance helicopter, volunteered to rescue wounded men from a site in enemy-held territory, which was reported to be heavily defended and to be blanketed by fog. To reach the site, he descended through heavy fog and smoke and hovered slowly along a valley trail, turning his ship sideward to blow away the fog with the backwash from his rotor blades. Despite the unchallenged, close-range enemy fire, he found the dangerously small site where he successfully landed and evacuated two badly wounded South Vietnamese soldiers. He was then called to another area completely covered by dense fog where American casualties lay only 50 meters from the enemy. Two aircraft had previously been shot down and others had made unsuccessful attempts to reach this site earlier in the day. 
With unmatched skill and extraordinary courage, Major Brady made four flights to this embattled landing zone and successfully rescued all of the wounded. On his third mission of the day, Major Brady once again landed at a site surrounded by the enemy. The friendly ground force, pinned down by enemy fire, had been unable to reach and secure the landing zone, although his aircraft had been badly damaged and his controls partially shot away during his initial entry into the area, he returned minutes later and rescued the remaining injured. Shortly thereafter, obtaining a replacement aircraft, Major Brady was requested to land in an enemy minefield where a platoon of American soldiers was trapped. A mine detonated near his helicopter, wounding two crew members and damaging his ship. In spite of this, he managed to fly six severely injured patients to medical aid. Throughout that day, Major Brady utilized three helicopters to evacuate a total of 51 seriously wounded men, many of whom would have perished without prompt medical treatment. Major Brady's bravery was in the highest traditions of the military service and reflects great credit upon himself and the United States Army. An average day was we hooked a, a Jeep battery up to a, a buzzer. And the average day was that buzzer, uh, the first up aircraft, one, one ring, second aircraft, two, third was the one we had to hoist on, three. And the crews were lined up, ready to go, and in an average day we flew 16 hours. Uh, we, carry, we flew 28 combat missions, four of them at night, and we averaged 70 patients a day. So from morning, 24 hours a day, that damn horn was going off. Boom, boom, boom. And then immediately, the co-pilot ran for the aircraft. Our standard was two minutes off the ground. There's a wounded, bleeding person out in the field somewhere. The pilot aircraft commander went to the operations shack, and he did a quick asthma time distance check. So he knew when he got off the ground immediately what heading to take up and about how far the patient was from where we were. And two minutes we're off the ground, we're en route to the area and we're talking to the guy with the patient. Very important because as soon as he heard dust off, as soon as he heard our voice, he could relax. He knew uh, that help was on the way. The key was then to be able to sort out, number one, the signal, how many patients they had. We very seldom ever used litters because you only need a litter if a guy's got a neck or a back injury. So the idea was, you know, you got 10, 15 patients there. You don't want to go in twice. You want to get them all if you can at once. So a litter just clogs it up. <clears throat> but if you had a neck, headwind or injury, you'd have to put them on a litter. You have to be more careful. But the idea was to get in and get out quick. They will tell you the area is secure but oftentimes, when they told you that, they were whispering. <laughs> and by the way, somebody just shot those guys. Where the hell did he go? So we didn't pay any attention to it. The standard was in our unit, don't talk to me about the security of the area. I don't care. You just tell me one thing, and that's if you will stand up and help my guys load the patients. Because so many times, we would come in and get in the ground, and if you're in elephant grass or something like that, you can't see the patient and the guy won't stand up and help you load, and you're just sitting duck. And before you know it, then your aircraft's full of bullets and somebody's wounded, and so it's a mess. So standard was stand up, help my guys load the patients. We're going to load them through one door, and, uh, and uh, we're going to come in. Just that simple. The most important thing was the terrain. Because in certain terrain, you could get very, very close to the enemy, and it didn't matter what weapons he had. If you were behind a rice burn or in a tree line or whatever, you'd be really safe. Whereas if you didn't come in the right way, you were, you were toast. So one day I'm flying with this warrant officer, and uh, 
makes a nice tactical approach. Come up a dry riverbed, we jump over the trees, come in, enemies in that tree line, turn our tail into the fire. Always turn your tail into the fire if you came in the right way because it was so much harder for that bullet to get to you if it had to go through a transmission than if it went through the windshield. And if you had them come through the windshield a few times, you did not want that to happen again. So you would turn your tail into the fire and then you sit down. And if you've ever been in a deal like that where everybody's crawling around and they're shooting and screaming and yelling, you know what it's like to pucker. And puckering is when the cheeks from the lower part of your body slowly begin to envelop your ears. <laughs> so I, I know there's somebody that's had that experience. <laughs> So we're sitting there and you try to make yourself as small as you can, but you're in a great big old Huey and you're the biggest thing in the area, but you still try to shrink as small as you can. And me and my buddy are shrunk up like this and we're trying to get the patients on and trying to get out as fast as we can. Never wanted to be on the ground more than 20 or 30 seconds if you could help it. But we're sitting there all puckered and shrunk up and I look over at my buddy and his head's going like this like Siamese belly dancer all over the cockpit. Back to the patients, get them out of here and let's get going as quickly as we can. And back to my buddy. And I couldn't help myself. I just broke down and I laughed out loud, but he didn't miss a stroke. His head's going like this and he said, laugh you son of a bitch, but it's harder to hit a moving target. <laughs> The 6th of January, 1968, began with a call from a ridge in enemy-held territory. An injured soldier had to be evacuated, the site was heavily defended, and it was shrouded in thick fog and smoke. But one day I get a, I get a call for a kid in the afternoon and he's bit by a snake. And he's on an outpost and the outpost is on the top of a mountain. And when I got there, the clouds had covered the mountain about 1,500 feet down from the top. And so as I came into the area, I had no idea how I was going to get through that stuff because it's zero, zero. But I knew that if I went into it and, and lost references, I could fall off into the valley and I'd be okay. So I did it. I went in and I was all messed up. I couldn't see anything flying straight ahead. And so I fell off in the valley. I did it, and crew's getting, I did it about three or four times. The crew's getting nervous. I'm praying like crazy. God, why are you doing this to me? You know, help me out. <clears throat> so the, the crew's really nervous. I'm frustrated. And so the next time, I say, we'll go one more time, guys. That's it. We've done the best we can. <clears throat> so the next time I go up into it, the wind hits me and it blows me sideways. I always flew with my right wind. I flew the right seat because you lead with the right foot, right? You got more power. And so I flew the right seat, window down. The wind was the breath of God because it blew me sideways. And I could see out my window and I could see the treetops. I thought we were going into the trees and I was looking for a hole in the jungle. I could see the treetops and I could see the tip of my rotor blade. So guess what, I got two reference points and I know I'm right side up. So that's what I did. I turned it sideways, went right up the mountain and into the area. We got the kid that was snake bit, we got him to the hospital and he lived. So that's the technique that I used the day that I got the medal because in that day it was low valley fog, but looks like a snow bank. But if you go to the edge of it and you got a trail and you use those two reference points. You can't go any faster than about a, a walk. You know, you're just barely moving because you gotta see the tip of the blade and you gotta see the trees so you can work your way through that stuff. Part of the Medal of Honor action that I was involved in, involved a minefield. There was a bird sitting on the ground and a mine went off 
<clears throat> killed some people in the area and he left the area. But I was overhead on another mission and I saw where he was sitting. So they called us back, everybody's wounded or dead, uh, and nobody else will, there were a few that weren't wounded or dead, but they wouldn't move. And so I knew that if I hit that spot, the chances are I would not set off a mine. Good chance, because the guy was sitting there just a few minutes before. The other problem is the rotor blades, the downwash from the rotor blades. If you're landing in a minefield and you make too much of a power change at the bottom, did not want to go into a flare. Flare was a bad idea anyhow, side or front. You didn't have to do that. But if you did stop suddenly and made a big power change, that could set off a mine. So on this, on this particular mission, uh, and we, we, we went into many minefields. A lot of the times we'd use the hoist. We actually pulled a dog out of a minefield once with a hoist, a scout dog. But I hit the spot, and to show you how kind of tricky it was when my guys were carrying the patients to the aircraft they actually set off a mine which was almost within the diameter of my rotor blades and uh, blew them up in the air and it was a mess the aircraft was a mess but they landed got the rest of the patients loaded them and we got them all to the hospital filled the helicopter with a lot of a lot of holes but that damn mine that they'd been running back and forth for several times to load the helicopter it was not very far outside the, it's a wonder we didn't set it off when we came in. Have to be very, very careful in minefields. It helps if the damn things are mined, uh, you know, if they're mapped. It helps if you know where the mines are. And uh, we used three aircraft and we got, we got, they said we got 50, we actually got probably 70 or 80 out that day, counting some of the other missions we flew. But it was just that simple. My guys were doing these kind of missions every day, and somebody saw me do it. I think what got them was these people had been in a fight all night, and there were 70 casualties in this area, and it was in the ground fog right below the fire support base. And they were watching when we came up out through the fog with the patients up to the thing. So they saw us come up out of that fog, they said like a ghost or something. And so that impressed some people there and they wrote it up and that's how I got the medal. The fire Major Brady took on that January 6th caused him to change out helicopters three times. His Medal of Honor citation credits him with saving the lives of 51 soldiers, however, He's quick to point out the actions of the other brave men with whom he served. The crew chief, in my judgment, in my early days, I think was the best trained soldier I've ever been around. I don't know how it is today, I'm sure it's the same, but the training they went through at Rucker and at other places, they were just outstanding. My, my, one of my great heroes of all time is a guy named John Hodgson who was my personal maintenance guy. Actually, there's a, there's a building named after him down at Fort Rucker. They wanted to name it after a, uh, some, some Medal of Honor hero. And I said, why don't you guys do something right and let's pick the guys who make the heroes and name this building after them. So John, that building is named after him. One of the great maintenance guys, he took 11 H-19s through an IG inspection without a major gig. He was a maintenance genius. All these guys, we'd get an aircraft shot down. <clears throat> he and I would go out to get it. I'd sit in the rice paddy and John would go through the aircraft and tell me whether or not it would fly. And if he said it would fly, that's good enough for me. Sometimes we fly back pretty low so we wouldn't have far to fall in some case. Some but he would, he would get in the other seat and I'd let him fly it back. So I love the guy. My crew chiefs that I had and the crew chiefs that I have been associated with uh, were incredibly well-trained soldiers. One of the guys that was with me in the minefield, his name was Pappy Coleman, and he almost got blown through the rotor blades. Well, I got a call, bittersweet night. Uh, my beloved Spurs had just kicked Miami's butt and they won the NBA championship for the fifth time and I'm exulting in that. I get a call from uh, Pappy's wife, and he's on his deathbed, and he wants me to take care of his funeral. So he died a couple hours later, and I promised I would do that. He wanted a military funeral. 
And Pappy was out of the hills of Kentucky. Pappy didn't speak really good English. Hard to understand, Pappy, and all those people in those hills uh, where the Hatfields and McCoys hung out. But he was one heck of a soldier. Uh, three silver stars, three purple hearts. He's in the Army Aviation Hall of Fame. He got shot, one, shot three times, but one time he took a bullet right through the lips. They jumped on him, he's bleeding, and he says, not to worry, he says, I just kissed the bullet that had my name on it. He jumps up back into the thing, and then with me in the minefield, he's almost blown through my rotor blades. Another time he shot in his chicken plate a couple times before he finally figured out who's shooting him. He kills the guy and he goes back and gets the patient. So anyhow, Pappy is who I use, and, I, and we buried him up in the hills of Turkey Creek, Kentucky, uh, and he had full everything. So anyhow, I use, I use Pappy as an example of a hero. He is a courageous person, no question about it. Three silver stars, three purple hearts. He helped evacuate probably 3,500 people in his, in his year in Vietnam. He, 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 he took care of them. He was a medic. He's got 18 years of service. 18 years. His wife and daughter call and say, Pappy, you got to come home. We got problems with the children. We need you. He gave up those two years, his pension, his career. He'd have been Sergeant Major of the Army. Everything to go home and take care of his family. So why was he a hero? He was a hero because he was a good person. Goodness should be the essence of heroism. We ought not to have any hero, anyone we call a hero, who is not also a good person. Pappy was a good person, and that's why he was a hero. Freedom is, is what everybody puts a uniform on for. That's what, why businessmen create jobs. That's why we have free enterprise in this country. That's why we love our neighbors, uh, our families. Uh, it's, it's everything that is American or has always been American in the past. And so it's the, it's the one thing, courage, the one thing that is the key to the success of this country, the freedom of this country. And we know that we're not all born equal. We know that, we can look around it, we can see people bigger, stronger, smarter than we are, have more opportunity than we have. But in the one way that we are all born equal is in matters of courage. Each of us can have all that we want. You can't use it up. It's the key to success, it's the key to freedom. And with it goes sacrifice, which is the key to happiness, and simply love in action. It's things we do out of love. The more we're able to do it, the more we're able to be happy, and the more we're able to take care of our neighbors and our families and our, our loved ones.